one, we are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Intros, most of your show, but we're done now. Oh, Thanks for doing it. No, <laughs> my foot was <laughs> my foot was tapping again, drumming my drumming my pencil, and yeah, we did. Um, day. No, we got Saturday. a new show that came out the other day, and the music was just like everybody's like, "Wow, David did that!" And we're like, "He's he's really getting into the music." Yeah, that's yeah. what happens when you have COVID and you have to lay around for two weeks <laughs> and you can't do anything. You just redo all the show intros and outros. That's what he does. The guy in the background is David. Yes, for sure. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. And I, I love the graphic behind us and uh, the yeah. flag and such. And there you go. Yeah. I just want to put my hand on my chest and take my hand. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Great. Anyway, uh, we today we have a great, uh, another great artist from BC, uh, Jenny Lewis. And we're going to talk about her abstract art again. And we've seen a lot of abstract art before on our shows, off and on. And how is it different than anything else and, and 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 why do you like this one more than the other one and but i think there's we're gonna we're gonna go underneath the paint with hers a little bit today mm -hmm. she doesn't realize we're gonna talk about that the the thing you lay down on that canvas before you put paint down and it's right. not the primer but i think it kind of starts up here and very we'll, cool well, i've seen stuff. her stuff and it's fast I'm, i like it so i'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to the interview well let's talk with her Let's, we should probably bring her in, or we can just talk about her. Or we talk yeah. about her, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, welcome to the show, my dear. I'm going to disappear and let you two art aficionados uh, do your thing, and I'll see you at the end. Enjoy. Yeah. Well, good day to you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good morning. I guess it's morning. It just depends whoever and whenever somebody wants to watch something here and uh, what time it will be in their zone. Um, yeah, he says, you know, we were looking at – we always talk about people's journeys and it sounds kind of hokey, but really we all have our own way of getting there. I guess our journey and our talk. And, we, and I think that is of interest to not only artists, but I guess collectors and we'll call them collectors and buyers, but people who generally are interested in work and they want to know a bit of background. Well, why did you do that? But also why do I like that? Like why does a person actually go and say, I like that more than that or I prefer this more than that. And you, you seem to, I, I go through some of your bio and we, you know, and I think I get some of that information from that, but talking with you about it probably is probably more important. Um, trying to figure out, and as I alluded to, what do you put down on the canvas and the paper before you put pigment on there? And it, it, it comes about, I guess from your thoughts and your, you know, a little bit of your the history, your background, and well, we'll just talk a little bit about some of those things, you know, even down to that little bit of self doubt. Oh, like, it's not always a little bit. Does, <laughs> does everybody artist have that? So, give us a little bit of background about, you know, who, what, what, where, and why uh, of you a little bit before we just start, and then we can roll some of your imagery up and we'll, we'll sure. look at that. Yeah. Sure. So do you want the long story, the short story? Well, we got a little time. We'd, we'd like to hear, you know, not from the time you got born, but we'd, we'd sort of like oh, really? to hear. <laughs> well, I think there's influences early in life to, you know, why yeah. you're doing what you're doing today a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's, in, it's interesting because for me, I started relatively late as an artist. Uh, in my bio, it even says, you know, when I was when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I was always told to stick to sports and one of the key reasons is I could never stay in the lines. So it was a natural thing for me. And I guess at that time, you know, we all get, we have expectations from others about how we're supposed to show up and what we're supposed to be. And so I went the corporate route with my career and mm -hmm. I had a full career and I'm officially hanging it up this year. I have very little that I still do in it because I am full-time artist, but um, it really started in my early 50s, 
And I met an artist in Vancouver. She had a studio on Granville Island and abstract art. And I was craving color in the house. Just we had art, but it wasn't original art. And I just wanted something colorful. So I started taking private lessons with her when I could in between my consulting business. And the passion grew from there. And she always said, well, Jenny, you're always an artist on the inside. You know, you just haven't gone there yet. <laughs> and so that's where it started. And I just, there's something magical about being able to just go to canvas when it's blank and not have any idea of what's going to show up in the end. Because that's very much what my work is like for the most part. And back in those days, it was just for our house, but people would come in and then they would help the work and they would buy pieces and did some shows. And uh, it was always a battle about which room I would go into, you know, the studio or the office, because I had a home-based office. Mm -hmm. And the pool was always the studio, but I had demands and deadlines in the business side. So COVID, I think help to escalate going to art full time. So I've been painting and creating before I was doing the math, what are we? About 16 to 18 years. But it was always just when I could fit it in. But I was still doing a lot of work and still doing shows. And when COVID kicked in, it was about learning the business side of art as well as just spending time creating and trying some new things. And then we moved to the Okanagan in BC from the coast and not really known in the region. So just started creating a lot. And I've, I'm on the uh, Summerland Arts Council on the gallery committee. And currently right now I've got three different galleries that my work is in and um, I just keep painting and I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No. And you do end up with pressures, I think, from galleries can I have more, can I have more and I think other artists are kind of interested in how do you manage that? You should you shuffle things from one gallery to another? Do you paint in one style of abstraction or do you do you move around in a couple of different styles in abstraction but relative to media or Yeah. Well, you know, and this is this is interesting because if you've looked at my work on my website, you'll see there's various styles of abstract that I do. And I even uh, a few years ago was in Santa Fe and I wanted to get some feedback from a gallery owner. And he pretty much looked at my work and. We lost your sound. We lost your sound. Did you touch a button? I can't hear you. There we go. There you there go. go. Not, I didn't do it. Computer had a mind of its own. We're gonna get um, we're gonna get Stephen to start our first image up here, and we can talk. And yeah. There we go. Okay, so, so you, this you, is. You said you were in the states in Santa Fe, and you. Santa Fe, and the gallery owner was saying I didn't have a signature look, and then I've had another opinion from a a, a highly regarded artist um, that I was all involved in a program uh, taken from her, and she said I do. It's in your brush stroke. It's in the color. It's it's your style. He's, and she said, and I love this, and this is Jody King. She said, you know, we are artists. We are creative. So how can people expect us just to produce the same thing again and again and again? And right. I'm very much like that. So this piece here is the late one of my latest works that I'm doing currently. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to do where there was more color blocks because a lot of my stuff is a, just a merge and mesh of color with the exception of the black and white cityscapes that I've done. And this is just fun. I find like to prep for these, because um, you had asked about that earlier, Paul, is that with any painting that I do, I'll do generally speaking, I will do a meditation. It could be a guided meditation or just focus on breathing. But the whole idea is to get out of my head and not think about it. And then when I truly am out of my head, without any predefined outcome that I'm striving for, then my best work will show up. Yeah. Um, and typically I will etch in marks and lines and then none of that shows up as I paint along. I cover that over and uh, things show up. So this one is more, I don't know what you call it. I think I, 
call this series the Believe Series. And the reason why I call it the Believe Series is, again, been working really hard in the last little bit to believe in myself as an artist. And I think for all of us out there, we've got that self-doubt. We've got that voice in our head that takes me back to when I was a kid going, who the hell do you think you are, Jen, that you can produce this stuff? You're not good enough. You'll never sell things. So I'm I'm learning to squash that. I'm learning to put out to the universe and <clears throat> manifest that I'm an extremely successful artist. And do I still need to move along that path? Yes, I'm selling works and I'm in galleries, but I'm striving still for more. And I love, love painting. Yeah. So um, this is called Believe, and it's just about getting out of your head and see what shows up. And I wanted to do a different look without so many colors. So this is primarily black, white, and uh, oxide, translucent oxide, yellow, and red. And then it's just uh, some sepia, and that's it for the color palette. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a, an earthier palette. With, and either, yeah. Some of the other, <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. Some of yeah. the other works are, are very vibrant and, and quite br and brilliant um, as well. Yeah, these feel pieces, um, there's energy in this piece, and I love it. And, and oh, I, thank you. I love it. And I, that's why I chose it for the, the opening slide, uh, just for people to look at that and see, well, yes, you're going to see things like this, but we're going to see a, quite a variance of work. And that doesn't mean like a lot of artists can say, you can paint differently. You do not have to paint the same painting over and over and over and over again. Um, and I find that with some some artists, they tend to stay really within a certain palette all the time. And it, it's sometimes hard to break out from that. If So is this a mental thing a little bit when you come on and say, I feel like warm colors today? Is that Does that come yeah. up to you? Yeah, very much so. That's... Um... For me, it's after I've produced and created a number in a in the same look, like my colorful mountains, as an example. I think I sent you some of those as images. Um, there's a time where I go, okay, I'm just ready for something different right now. And it doesn't mean I won't go back to that, because I have people that are on my newsletter and follow me on social media because they love the bright colors. So I will go back to that, but I needed a break. Yeah. This one, I think, was really cathartic to help me break into a new style that I wanted to try. And it was, I was in a program with, um, it's called Studio Elite, and it was Jody King out of Austin, Texas. I was selected, small group of artists, five of us, one from London, myself from Canada, and three from the U.S. all over. And it's a six-month program where we had the mentoring and coaching, and I'm really a big believer in continual learning and not thinking I know it all. So I'm always looking for those opportunities to grow my skill, but also to understand the business side of it better. So we had a retreat as part of it. And this piece and its sister piece was created at that retreat. And it was really a departure from what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I call it with the sister Moody Blues. I think on the website, I call it something different, but we have both pieces now up in our home um, until they get sold. But for now, we love them in our home. And I was going, oh, my God, the colors, they're very moody compared to what I normally do. Yeah. And I love it. It's just a it's a big change for me. But I love the markings and the lines. And I know when I was stepping back and looking at it, Jody came by and whispered in my ear and said, don't change a thing <laughs> because yeah. I've you probably heard this from other artists, but we do a lot of self-editing. Like it should be finished. And with abstract, there's no final defined look until you land on it. But yeah. then afterwards, that little voice in the head will go, well, maybe if we do this or that, and then we really, I'm potty mop, so I won't do that on this interview. But we, you know, we really <laughs> can mess it up and we can overpaint. So she said, do not change a thing. Yeah. And so this I listened is, to yeah. the voice. Yeah, the immediacy of also chance things that happen whether you know certain pigments running together and a line that shows up and you you debate whether you should scrub it out paint over it or just leave it alone and work around it and this can happen in a like especially in a watercolor where you'll lay a wash down and 
wet into wet and it'll run and move into the other areas of your painting that were uncontrolled because you forgot to tip the paper back the other way or something. But it creates different explosions in your work. And mm -hmm. if you go try to go back in and touch something up, things happen with that pigment that, you know, whether you uh, say you go back in and add a little bit of water, clear water, or you'll end up with a big blossom that pushes back the pigment. And it's hard to imagine what will happen. Yeah. But if you don't try that, you never learn that that can happen and use that experience in a future piece uh, for something. And you don't want to ruin the one that you're working on. But then I, I take the respect of others who said, ruin it. It doesn't matter. It, it really is. That is a huge risks chance thing. It's sort of like the last piece of paper. What do you put on the last piece of paper that's blank? And you know that it's Sunday and you can't get any more paper if you mess it up. And that's a huge, and it'll sit as a blank in you and it holds you back from actually working on things. Yeah. So we, and I think you alluded that, to that a little bit in the self-doubt thing a little bit. But it does come again in that experience and trust in yourself, right? To to actually create pieces of work. Yes, I am an artist. I don't mm -hmm. have to write it on a wall. I don't have to yell it from a building. And it doesn't even have to make X amount of sales per month to say you're an artist. Uh, but you have to believe you're an artist. And you do. Yeah. You do. It's really nice to hear other people say, oh, she's an artist. And in in, yeah. in in a third person sense where one person is talking to another one, but that can be taken out of context too, where you, you're unapproachable because somebody else has elevated you amongst the community, say within a show that they will feel like you're unapproachable. So really important that artists really reach out at their shows and be really, uh, I guess, friendly, but open to conversations and talking okay. about them, not just your artwork. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I think just along those lines, Paul, just building on what you've said, probably some of my best works have come from when I've made what I would call. And yeah, we're losing sound again here. Uh, something's a little unstable there. Yes, yeah, yeah. my best pieces have evolved because of the mistakes that I make, but it took me years to trust the process. Right. Yeah. Right? I just trust the process and get out of my head. Something it's with abstract, something will show up. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, for sure with abstract, but you know, it's like everything else, mud can happen. And oh. <laughs> so I think it's really important that people understand that things are planned. You mean you plan your palette and your colors and what are needed in you. An artist has some understanding of color mixing. Uh, certain things work better together to give you that energy you want yeah. to personify in your two dimensional piece. And I, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at that. Is it about sales? Does your work, um, uh, the lack of words talk to one another. In other words, you do one piece and it reflects on the next one and on the next one, on the next one. Like there's a conversation between pieces. Well, I haven't really thought about it as a conversation, but I suppose in a way it does happen because uh, you mentioned it a moment ago, you know, we, we pick up something that happened in the first piece and I go, oh, I want to remember that because that's pretty cool. You know, and how do, and I just did that actually a few days ago on a new piece that's behind me, you probably can't see it, but they, they evolve. So the two pieces or the first one that you showed, I've been working with that approach and style and it's evolved even more from the one that I sent right. you. Yeah. Um, so I think they do speak to each other that way. And this piece and the other one, the, this is the pair of Moody blues <laughs> and I painted them at the same time. Yeah. And so I like I, having more than I, one I, painting I, I, on the wall. So they're side by side when you're painting on them, that kind of thing? Yeah, and I turn them upside down and sideways <laughs> and backwards. And uh, when I was working on them, I just had access to one easel. So one would be on the ground leaning up against something or even on the ground flat. And then I just switched them up. And I found that, um, you know, just by when it's not the 
the mountains that I do or the ladies or the cityscapes, but true abstract in this essence expressionist mm -hmm. is turning them around just gives a whole different perspective. Yeah. And, 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 you're, and you're not adverse to people doing that when they purchase your work too. Oh it's gosh, like, no. They can do whatever they like with turning things. You bet. It's their piece. So this is a piece. This is uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I ventured into changing the palette and I created a series of black and white cityscapes. And I almost call this like an urban scape now. Yeah. But all the black and whites are painted over paintings that I just didn't like. They just were sitting there. There were these canvases. And I go, oh, the heck with it. I'm going to start painting. I go, you know what? It's time for a change. Let's get, let's get rid of all the color and just do black and white values. But in this particular piece, it was the second in the series, Something interesting showed up in the bottom left where you see the rust and the yellow and uh, that warm color. And um, I yeah. loved it. So yeah. I left it there. And then in each of these, I've embedded a face in all my black and white cityscapes. So when I when people look at them, this one actually just sold uh, last week on Friday. Wow. <laughs> with another black and white to a commercial space up here in the interior in Kelowna. And, you know, the, the collectors will look at this and they'll go, oh my God, there's so much stuff embedded in there that at first glance, you don't really see it until you see it in person. Mm -hmm. And often they can't even notice the face until I say, oh, do you find the face? Which for me, the face just represents that there are people in the city and they're everywhere that you look. But I also like to have a little fun with my paintings and just see if people can find them. <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people you find these, they do appear on themselves. Just some people will do, you know, little animals and little, you know, the uh, yeah. wall, the Waldo of the painting shows up somewhere. Yeah. And sometimes good, sometimes bad. But the only way you're going to get those texture buildups and the color is to, like you said, paint over an existing piece. And I think people that are kind of stuck on where are they or how do they go, go to black and white for a while. I think yeah. it, it, in the gray values and play with your gray values because I think those will freshen up your palette. And like you said, leaving a spot within your work uh, freshens that work. But so different from your other pieces of just pure abstraction. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't do a so-called cityscape or like you said, a portrait or something. Because yeah. I think that develops your style that um, you know, for lack of words, a Picasso didn't just paint portraits or no real life, you know, and you could look at them and you knew possibly who did them, you know, uh, just by the style of the work, right? If he did a portrait, God forbid, that's what you are. <laughs> You'd look like that. Um, so I think this yeah. is, this is refreshing to see, especially people who follow you. And they say, well, I've already got a Jenny Lewis painting that looks like the bright one. That, but, oh, my gosh, i got to have this one because it's different. You don't want a wall full of the same, I think. But you'd like your collector to find more of your work because once you've found a collector, you want to keep feeding their experience and their, I guess, excitement in, in what you're doing. And I think this kind of thing does that. It, it's a fresh palette. Relative, these are sit side by side from the first piece. They are very different done color wise as well as structure. Yeah. But that, uh, it just, I think you have to do that what feels right for you. And uh, that builds, a, like you said, builds your confidence in one way. And I think, do you find confidence has come from sales a bit? When other people like what you've got, that you've got, and um, oh, for sure, it does. Um, you know, it's a validation. Yeah. Um, and, it and buys it, pigment as well, but I think it. <laughs> yeah, but it's. Um, yeah, you know, you you'll get the feedback when you make the sale. You know, and I had two pieces that sold. You know, to this commercial space in one day. You know, I go, oh, you know, this is this is great. This is what it's all about. But it's interesting. I don't paint with just the intention this has got to sell because i think if you do that it well for me it will screw it up for sure <laughs> yeah. uh, it's about when i paint having fun when i paint 
because yeah. when the fun's not there, it just doesn't show up on the canvas. So if I'm trying too hard, I'll step back at the end of that session. And I do that. I still do that. And then I look and I go, this, oh, God, this is just crap. Okay, let's just leave it today. And I'll come back to it tomorrow or another day and clear my head. And let's just go at it and, again, see what shows up. But that's also the beauty of working with acrylic. It can be very forgiving that way where I can just keep going at it. Um, so, but so, so is painting fun for you or is it work? Is it is it a job, or is it, or is it fun? Is it a fun job? Is it? Well, that's how do you, how do you relate that? And that's an interesting question because you know I've been working for over five decades, <laughs> and I'm going okay, okay, I'm done with kind of the work thing. But you know, as I am full time now, I mean, I'm not you know uh, doing you know eight to five every week. That the hours are very random, and there's flexibility and freedom in that. And with the business side, because there is the whole business side of art. And when you're a one person shop like I am, at times that can feel like work. The yeah. actual painting does not. Yeah. That's that's the fun. That's the creative time. That's where I forget about everything else that's going on. I get the call from upstairs from my husband or my dog is at my ankle going, okay, mom, you know, when's dinner coming? That type of thing, because... I'll be in there for what was, oh, I'm just going to touch this part up and then hours go by. Yeah. So I think like many artists, it's like we would love just to be creating all the time and not worry about the social media posts, the reels that you have to do, um, you know, connecting with galleries, doing doing that part of it. But we have to, or at least I find I have to in order to get things out and be consistent so every week that something is happening and not just randomly yeah i i think that grounds an artist that puts their feet on the ground and uh some are grounded too much by it they worry about it they you know because you have to make your rent payment and food and if you are an artist for a career um it's it becomes a uh if it's sort of like you, if you get in behind behind the eight ball on it. In other words, you're in the rears, right? You you have to make a sale this weekend. You have to do this. You have to do that. That puts a different pressure on you. Now you're producing. What kind of work are you producing? You're, you're trying to produce work that will sell that weekend, um, which is a whole different pressure on an artist. It also may change. So in other words, you could not do this painting you did if you had to have it done for the weekend for a show because that the underlying piece was an existing piece of work that took time to do to start with that is invested in that way unless you had a whole stash of paintings you had to paint over <laughs> and oh, i do have a lot of paintings <laughs> yeah I, I think a lot of us have yeah. and I said, well yeah you, you paint over them and make some dollars from it which is great or do you take them to the fire pit and you and you have a you have a burning, a cleansing of burning. Yeah, and I, well. <laughs> Some, I look back and I go, oh, that really wasn't that good. But whatever, just keep it there for now and we'll see what happens down the road. And and bang on about the pressure. The pressure, you know, if financially you've got to be, this is your only source of income when you are a full-time artist. Um, it can really, for me, when I feel that way, it stifles my creativity. So that's where trying to do something before I even go to the canvas that day to clear the head. You know, it could be a walk. It could be gardening. Um, it could be some sort of meditation. But it will help. But you're right. Um, you know, we have to always be thinking of how do we get the word out there? How do we approach the galleries? And then how much of that do you want to do? Like how a lot of artists that I speak to locally – they just go. Oh, I'm just going to paint. I'm. I'm not going to. I. I'm. I'm. I can't do that other stuff. I just don't like doing it. And the pieces just sit there in the studio, yeah. you know, or in the home. And for many, that's fine because they're loving what they do. And then for others, probably like me, you know, we do want to make a living out of the the work that we do. But I think it's kind of it's kind of and a lot of other artists like I'll say graphic designers they they envy the artists that can sit and paint so-called what they want to paint. Um, 
a graphic designer can actually make a fairly good living on a day-to-day -day basis, but they have to do what other people want them. It's sort of like being a doing commissions every day, every hour of the day, and mm -hmm. there are deadlines and all the pressures of the job, but they're paid decently, usually, uh, for doing that kind of work. Um, this, the kind of work that we do, or you do, um, you know, it's, you need a number of galleries to help you. Excuse me. Um, it's hard to do it on your own on just pop-up shows and little, you know, because you save your inventory up for a solo show. Um, you sell online, offline, off your website, or then have a pop-up. Again, you're doing all the work yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was in business, one of my, my, my best business partner that I ever had was my courier driver who would pick up, and these are the old days, he'd take up, take my jobs. I was a designer in the day, a commercial designer. He'd take my jobs and deliver them to the print shops and different things. I didn't have to get in my car and drive them around. So every time it cost me $2.50 in the day for them to take that courier away was making me money because I didn't have to do other things. So it becomes the business, like you said, the business part of doing what you do. Do you really need to go to the art store today to buy that Liquitex, you know, uh, the, that? Or can you combine that with another trip that you had to go for something else anyway? And you can skip in quickly and, and do it so you consolidate um, your trips into one rather than into three separate trips. You know. Well, I always try to look at it that way and I think that's from the business that I've had for mm -hmm. many years consulting because it was on leadership development and coaching and team building and doing all the corporate stuff the corporate corporate world was my client base so I would go in there and do the seminars and work on projects related right. so a big part of that was I had to be organized and I was a one person shop on that and you know I also thought of getting a team and then I go no nah, this is this is what I create. This is what I'm known for. And so what I do with my art is very much along the same lines. Yeah. This is now what I'm known for. Um, and I, I do think, though, to your words, you know, having a team, if you're in a position and that is your intention to have someone that can assist you with the social media. I mean, that's that's a big help or publicity, you know, because I've I've got awards recently with my cityscapes, uh, colorful as well as the black and white, you know, through online competitions. But, you know, for me to get out there and publicize that in the way that I should, I, I know I'm not doing that. I'm doing a little bit, but I could certainly do, be doing more. So that's something that I still think about. So how important do you think that is for the public to see that you've won an award, that you won a competition or that you've placed in a certain thing? How important is that? Is that important to buyers? Um, well, the, the input that I've had on that is that it's very helpful. Yes. It's helpful. Yeah. Because what it does is it builds, I guess, for people that are just coming up across the work for the first time, it builds that credibility behind the artist. Oh, this is somebody that, you know, is accomplished in the field that they're working in. And mm -hmm. it, it helps. The kudos definitely help and assist and build the brand as an artist yeah. so yeah i would yeah. i would say it is important that when you do um and i'm still trying to manage how i do that so i don't have all the answers on, <laughs> on this by any means but i know i've been taught by other accomplished individuals in the field that this is something you have to do i yeah. think there's yeah confidence building in your buyer is they, they don't want to feel they want to feel like you are the up and coming that you they have bought quality uh they feel value in what you've purchased what they have purchased but they also validate you in that i want to put you on my wall uh in that sense and say i'm i'm proud to be associated with you and that's what they say when they piece a piece of work in their room or their office yeah uh, it personifies them it's sort of like wearing a branded t-shirt say by nike you want that affiliation with Nike with yourself that you bought a quality item and that you you have this little Nike thing on your uh, apparel that you wear. Why else do you wear signature works? Um, it's an association. You wear you go to a concert. You bought the Led Zeppelin T-shirt. 
what does that tell you? Oh, I like Led Zeppelin. Otherwise, I would maybe never wear that shirt. It, it tells you a little bit about that person. You wear it around and you're proud of it. And I think, yeah. I think artists need to understand that that's important to think in the context of the buyer to understand them. Do they want to put what you have to say on their wall? Right. And I, that, that's a very big part. And I, I, I do believe that the other part is they want to, you know, and it ties in with that is getting to know the artist. They, they want to know who you are. So I got some interesting feedback from, it was an, in, through an interior designer that I got these two pieces and in, in the commercial space, which is one of my niche markets that I want to go after as far as interior design to get to commercial space. Cause a lot of my pieces are big, so they don't always fit in people's home. And um, the client, I took it up there because it wasn't far from here. And it was one piece that they were looking at. And I met with this one individual and she loved it, but it was for a colleague of hers in the next office that I bought it in for. So I left it there. They, he needed to look at it. And then I get a text going, well, good news, sold two. And the feedback was that the fact that she met with me got to know me a little bit and my story as an artist really personalized the experience for her and made the piece that much more meaningful when she bought it. So I think, you know, as an artist, building that relationship with people, whether it's, you know, online, through social media or newsletters, but having that personal touch in some way. I work in a, well, I'm part of a co-op gallery also, and with that, we go and we work, you know, one day a month in the gallery. So I'm kind of extroverted, so I don't have an issue talking to people. And a couple came in that was on their travels across Canada. And this little place is a summer destination for many people in BC. And talking to this couple, and I just, it was so easy. And for them, you know, they gave me that feedback that, one, they love learning about an artist's journey, which I think is what you're doing here with your interviews, Paul. It's a great thing because it helps individuals to get to know the artist better. And if they, you know, had a bigger vehicle and could carry something on their roof rack, they would probably have got a piece. But I think that personalization and relationship building is extremely important. Um, in, in, in that context, we've had other artists that talk about people that vacation and travel and want to buy a piece of work that's awkward to take with them and say, well, you know what? I'll ship it for you. Yeah, for sure. these people that are on these cruise liners that come down the West coast, they may want to buy a piece of work. And he said, do you not worry about it? We'll have that shipped directly to your home. And when you get there, um, the piece of work will be delivered. Yeah. And I said, you just have to make it easy for them to understand. We'll yeah. take care of you. You know, we want to make the sale. We want you to be happy with one of our pieces of work. This piece of work, though, is quite different oh, yeah. than previous pieces. And yeah. uh, now, is this on paper, this piece? Ain't this is actually on campus. Okay. And this gesso on it. Um, and it's a technique. A number of years ago, we go down to the desert at the beginning of each year to get away from some of the Canadian winter that we experience here, as you know. <laughs> And so Tom, my husband, brings his bikes. He's a cyclist. I bring the art, and uh, I do hiking and art, and we have a dog that we, we love and do all the stuff with him. But I paint a lot when I'm down there, and we're in the California desert, and you're surrounded by these mountains. And a few years ago, I got raw canvas. I had never painted on raw canvas before, but for transport, it was the easiest thing to do because they were going to be big pieces. So it was... I got to say it was a challenge because it wasn't stretched. So this technique isn't on the raw canvas, but it came from that experience where I dilute the acrylic paint. Mm. And then typically we'll pour oh, one color, no more than two colors, but they're not touching each other initially. And you have to let it dry entirely. And then I just, once it's dry, then I just put another layer with a different color. And that's where you see some of these watercolor effects, really, because it almost looks like a watercolor in some regard. And then when I was doing it, what's interesting is I wasn't the first time through, not this piece, but the first series that I did of this look, I wasn't thinking about mountains. I was just playing with a technique that I'd picked up. 
And I just thought, oh, I'm just going to put colors on this. And then stepping back and looking at it later, I go, oh, my God, I've been inspired by the mountains around me and the surroundings and didn't even know that at the time. I wasn't conscious of it. Um, So it was really about being playful, experimenting, and then different things will show up. So this is a later version in series. And I found something really interesting. The raw canvas um, is so porous, as you know, that the watercolor effect works extremely well. When you get to the gesso canvases, I discovered it doesn't work so well. So I had to find the right one that wasn't so heavily gessoed in order to create this look. Yeah, the jet the gesture will leave the pigment up on top, doesn't absorb into the fibers. Yeah. Really. And but you have yeah. to understand that uh, the raw canvas does have a matte look to it, and it it absorbs and it'll do different things. But I'm um, you know you talked about this osmosis of place. You know, the I think artists get sensitive to that, and I think that's why we do retreats that's why we go to places that are different and travel as best we can to feel what's happening in different areas and then it could be the air like you said it can be the landscape and all of a sudden you realize where did that come from yeah and if you open your mind up to it and let it do it it'll help you uh find that way a lot of times especially in uh looser abstract works where you're not working on a defined paint between the line shapes, you know? Right, yeah. Probably. This is the one on raw canvas. Yeah, beautiful piece. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're very zen-like. Unusual for me. <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're working in a triangular motifs that are over layered and but the color palette and the energy that's there, I think is, uh, is quite refreshing. Actually, there's explosions of light and color. And uh, if you don't have those, you end up I think ho hum paintings. Yeah. You have to have some paintings with that aha feeling to them. And there should be a part of your painting that has some of that oomph that catches your eye but doesn't give it all away at one glance. You want to be able to go back and review it. And, and this one is layers of viewing. It's like these overlaying of slides. Mm-hmm. That you, if you've looked at mm-hmm. that, we had a little stack of slides and you're looking through the slides. And you see one image transposed through the other one. Uh, some people may not know what a slide is. Gosh forbid. <laughs> forbid, right? Oh, I don't know. I, I still have some. <laughs> we'll just go along here. So this is back to that one of the earlier. Pieces. Yeah, this is one um, from the last week that I finished. Wow. Um, yeah. So again, I love, I, love, I love the feeling of sienna's against so black and the umbers, yeah. right? They great? really give me a feeling of like I used to live in Ontario in the winter and in, in the spring, you'll see some of the ground cover covering through and a bit of snow. And there's a feeling of you know, there's, there's a different energy of, of things that are poking through. I can see all kinds of lovely things. And I usually go and comment and I see this and that. And I see that. I know. That. I get a lot of that with my work for people. I go, you do? Where's that? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. it's nice to see this one is probably more structured than some of the other pieces. Like, is it, but you know, anchoring it to the bottom, to the right. But again, you said you could turn this painting any which way you, if you liked, if it fit better horizontally, and, and it probably would be um, as fine that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So this is. And we're back to this kaleidoscope of color. I know that was a that was a, the name of a exhibit that I did in a gallery was kaleidoscope because the <laughs> mesh of colors. Yeah. Yeah. It, it so feels this, like- is, this <laughs> is for me, um, if anyone's listening that's ever been to the Coachella Valley and you're going along Highway 10 and you're going up the mountains to a little, oh my God, not little, but it's uh in the desert setting up in the mountains, though, called Pappy and Harriet's, and it's a big barbecue outdoor place, very casual, almost Western town like thing. And this reminds me of the journey there. You've got the little towns nestled at the base of the mountains on the desert floor, and then you, you know, you weave in and out of the mountains to um, yeah. get over to it's, Pappy. It's very, yeah. 
very much like going through the shoe swaps as well when you're going through yeah. there and through you're going to Kelowna and Penticton and all through the valleys through there. You can see that. We got to move that's along a little. Yeah, bit. that's interesting that you say that. I've got a big piece behind me. I don't think I sent it to you, but I'm calling it, you know, a journey through the Okanagan because it's a similar, but it's six foot wide. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, I know. So, like I say, commercial space because a lot of homes, except for the big new ones that are being built. But yeah. yeah. This is another fresh one. Back. Yeah. I love the city. These feel like, um, it, it feels like a, you know, a stack of bottles in the bar on the, on the table, you know, in black and white, yet it's this, it's this urban um, buildup and congestion feeling, yet it's still bubbly and jazz-like. I love the feeling of jazz in it. it mm. Oh, it's thank just you. Just yeah. little, just a little it's effervescence, little bubbles that are happening and, you know, the energies of yes, it's a city scene, but it can be other things. You know, it can it can represent a lot of things. This was featured. I'm, I'm not sure you may be familiar with it. Grain magazine. Um, it's a quarterly magazine published by the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, and uh, this was selected for the cover. And a lot of my other black and white images are kind of cropped and put throughout the magazine for the edition. And it's one that's very eclectic. It's got poetry and articles and, and what's in there relates, the piece actually relates somewhat to the, uh, the piece that's written. So that was, that was nice. That was just, that's just come out this summer. So that's another example of, I haven't publicized that enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go. Closing image. Sorry yeah. about the breakup of your uh, website address. It's <laughs> it, things happen when you yeah in in slideshows and they get really long urls and that happens with the end. But I'm sure there's Stephen right there. Or... Did you yeah, fall asleep? Yeah. I hope you didn't fall asleep during our conversation. I I can't tell you. I love her work. I yeah. would literally. I would I, the the one that the gentleman bought over the weekend with the the black and white cityscape with the little color below. I was looking at that and I saw that it sold. And I was like, sure, the one I like. But the last well, you one, can get, you can get a print of it, but it's not. The I, don't same do, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't do prints, please. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. yeah that, so. Um, but then the last one you just showed was very beautiful. No, your work's beautiful. So, no, Thank I like you. it. It's it's gorgeous. And I like the fact also that you spoke about the business of art. You mm -hmm. literally just did a show with a lady from London for another show we have on our channel. And that was the whole topic was the business of art. And what people really don't understand, what you were saying is what it really takes to be an artist today isn't mm -hmm. I'm going to paint and when I die, I'm successful, right? It's going to be, I'm going to paint. I want to be successful now so I can enjoy it. And that's 20% of my day. And the other 80% of the day is administrative. It's another 30%. And then the rest of it is marketing, 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 Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, blah, blah. It's just, and people don't realize, I think, what an artist actually goes through unless you're, you know, I, I always pick on him because I like it. Peter Max and you painted a pillowcase and became famous mm -hmm. and you've got, you know, people that, don't know any better so <laughs> and right so but it, it's it's one of those things well, i think we have some of this stuff but um people don't realize that what it really takes to be a successful artist because as you're to your point you can paint and be the next picasso or leonardo or whoever and if nobody ever sees it they don't buy it there's some fabulous artists um in the region that i live in in the okanagan and there's one actually that does fiber arts and I, you know, I volunteer in, in different places and I curated her to go into a big commercial space. Her work is freaking beautiful. I've never right. seen fiber art done the way she does. She's had so many conflicts. She says, I do not sell my pieces. I go, are you kidding me? She says, I can't let them go. She says, I love them too much. And I'm going, <laughs> Okay, so I I said, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, but it's hard. I remember when I first started out as an artist, I was like, oh no, I love this piece, I can't let it go. And now I'm just going, okay, just go, yeah. just go, because I'll just paint more. So that's okay. And that's true. When you can't be, you can't, well, you can be an artist for yourself, but if you want to be a living, an artist that makes a living from it, if you don't let it go, that's usually a problem. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
That's a yes. that's a business degree I have. I just put two and two well, together like that. True. <laughs> you usually just have to move the decimal point, and that usually will influence a lot of. I was just going to say, right? <laughs> so, but I, the, the, you were fascinating. And anytime you have something new that you want, please let Paul know and come back and show us some stuff. Oh. Your your stuff is gorgeous. Uh, I love you. it. So yeah, I so appreciate that. I'm, I'm very upset about the guy who's going to have a fire now in his building before those paintings are gone. But don't well, you know that, that big one that you like? That's that's still available. Okay, <laughs> we'll talk. So I like the little color. I like the little color one though too. That was very. Yeah, nice. I'm actually working on two more cityscapes with um, a lot of the black, gray, and white. But I'm leaving a little bit of color in there from that I collaged in from a piece of paper. Right. Uh, art that I created. Um, so I'm seeing how that's turning out. So stay tuned. <laughs> nice. We will. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening, or I should say watching. Thank you. Catch us here every Thursday. Paul will have somebody fantastic next week, I'm assuming. Not as fantastic as Jenny, but someone oh, is yes, almost sweet. as fantastic. Uh, and just, just thank you. Thank you, Paul and Stephen, for, you know, Come reaching out to me for this interview. I really do appreciate it. And it was a lot of fun. So anytime you want to do this, just let me know. <laughs> no worries. And also everybody, your Jenny's link will be below. Um, so you can click it and you can get a hold of her. If you can't figure out how to use it, call us at the show and we'll take care of it for you. Okay. So, you have a good thank day. you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. you Bye guys. Take care. Cheers.